Well, this is the last 20 minutes. Yeah, okay. it's okay. Mm -hmm. 20, okay. And don't forget Griffith and Right, I'm Kate. getting to <coughs> Seymour. Uh, we have a particular fascination with Seymour Stern, uh, the Griffith historian. Mm -hmm. You knew Stern. Very well, yes. And what kind of man was he? Well, of course, when I, first, when I first met him, I guess it would be in the early 1950s, and uh, he was sort of an unofficial arm of a little film society I joined, uh, which ev eventually became the Theodore Huff Memorial Film Society when uh, Herman and Seymour Stern and the others moved out of it. But I knew Seymour very well in that period. And it was at a time when the Museum of Modern Art was showing quite a lot of the Griffith films, fairly regularly filmed like Orphans of the Storm and Isn't Life Wonderful, many of which I hadn't seen up until that time. And it was a tremendous pleasure for me to go to the museum with Seymour and sort of see it with him and get his reactions after and have him comment on it. And I learned a tremendous amount from Seymour. He was already becoming just a little bit erratic. I think I caught him just in time. I had about five or six really good years with him. Uh, and then he became a little, as you know, a little, a little strange. I mean, no less interesting, but not quite as reliable historically. But I learned a tremendous amount from Seymour, and I got along very. I mean, we all at one time or another go through a period where Seymour would suddenly figure you were an enemy rather than a friend, without explaining why. Rather like W. C. Fields, and I think there was one period where he suddenly, suddenly um, felt I'd joined the enemy camp because I, I think one line of one program note contradicted something that he had once said. So that for a little while we were restrained, but we got together again. And we had no, no problems at all. I, I love Seymour. He he really had a running battle with the museum. Uh so well, I think he had a running battle with anybody. I mean, he really felt that uh, Griffith was sort of his, his personal property. And I could understand why at the time, when there was so little interest in film history, and he devoted his whole life to this man and his work, and he wanted to get his book out to be the definitive work. And I can see why he didn't like so many of these Johnny Come Lately's coming along and dashing off an article here with totally erroneous information. And um, no, I can understand his attitude, even though everything he did was in extreme, so he probably uh, said, far more than you really meant. I mean, he could very easily sound like a fanatic, and I don't think that he was. Why do you think his, his book never did get published? I think probably largely due to his own fault. I mean, A was a massive tome, and to get it published at all would be an achievement. And I know that when he did have tentative publishers lined up, he would insist on going down and checking the proofs and adding commas and saying, that's wrong, and you've got to do this in a different style of paper and a different style of lettering. And considering the um, virtually uh, non-existent commercial income from a book of that type at that particular time. I mean, he was lucky to get the thing published at all, and I think his own sort of, I wouldn't say arrogance, but his own um, possessiveness and insistence on doing it his way or not at all may have killed the project off. How do you see Seymour Stern's place in, in film history? Well, oh, I think it's very important. I think, you know, one, one has to, um, I mean, as, as the Griffith historian, his work is, is absolutely invaluable, uh, because it was done at the time. I mean, Today we can analyze Griffith and look back on it and dissect it and you know compare it with other things. And we certainly know, know more about film history now than we did then. But at the same time, Stern was there all the time. He was able to uh, reflect you know current trends of thought and current reactions. He talked about things with Griffith, and that kind of contact you you, you can't duplicate. And I think he's in, in, incredibly valuable. I just you know the, well, the only reservation I have is that people should know in what period he wrote certain things and to realize that toward the end of his life he became less reliable as a historian, although no less interesting as a, as a writer. And much of his work really ha hasn't been republished or, or it really is only available in going back to the original periodicals. Right. Mm -hmm. Many and I imagine his correspondence too because we didn't correspond that much. We had no need to because we were right on top of each other. But when he moved out to the coast, we corresponded quite a bit. His letters were so vigorous and virile and full of punch. I mean, it was a, just like talking to the man. He, he also uh, was very involved in MGM, uh, working for Thalberg. Right. And, and, uh, I didn't know a great deal about that. I, mean, I know he'd done it. Mm -hmm. uh, but somehow, when we talked, it was much more about uh, his universal period when he worked with Ray Taylor on the serials like The Indians Are Coming, about his work with Preston Sturges. But somehow, he never talked very much, to me at least, about the Thalberg period, other than that he didn't like him. What was it, his, his Preston Sturges period? He was involved with him at California? Yeah, he was a story uh, editor for Sturges. Uh, I gather he, re he read properties and made treatments of them and uh, may have worked on the scripts with Sturges. That I don't know, but he certainly selected properties or brought properties to Sturges' attention. Professor Everson, are, are you working on any, any current uh, book projects? Well, I'm always working on a couple, but there are so many on the market now. I'm not, and I'm um, very, very busy on other things, so I sort of haven't given myself any deadlines. And I'm doing a follow-up 
for um, Oxford University Press on the American silent film, but this is to be a survey of European silent film. And of course, it's been done before in individual studies of national cinema, but there are good books on the Swedish film, the French film, the German film, and so on. But this is kind of an overall survey of how they tie in one with the other, how one is influenced by the other. And also, I want to do what I did in the American silent film, and not just concentrate on the Eisensteins and the Podolkins and the big people, but also the, the bread and butter films and the films which really reflect the you know, the commercial industry of that country and not just the great classics. And there's a, you know, there's a whole new history of film just in that area alone. So I've been spending a lot of time in European archives and cinematics looking at films of that type and filling in gaps and sort of working on it slowly. And uh, Oxford have been very good at not, not pressuring me on that. Have you considered uh, a follow-up in the sense of a chronological follow-up dealing with the early sound period? No, because initially um, Andrew Saris was to do that at the same time. I was working on the silent film and he was working on sound film. And uh, his first, then it became a very ambitious project. His sound film volume became two volumes. And what happened to it, I don't know. I mean, I know he was working very hard on it. And so I screened him a lot of films, and I know he saw a lot of films elsewhere. Uh, so it was a, he was very, very dedicated to that project. And what happened to the book, I have no idea. But I know Oxford um, went through a period of temporarily losing interest in film books, because maybe two or three didn't sell that well. And also, they tend not to promote books terribly well, I think. Um, but they've got the Kozarski book on Stroheim coming up, and I guess they're getting back into the phase of pushing film books again. So maybe those two um, Cyrus books will materialize. I certainly hope so. I was asking, you, going back to the silence police of the program, Ernie Kovacs, uh, you mentioned hosted, yes. moderated some of the shows. What was he like at the time? Was he a, was he a film buff? Or? He was. I mean, he loved silent films. He didn't know a great deal about them, he was, but his heart was in it. He, he loved the idea of silent films, particularly, of course, silent comedy, which he learned a great deal from his own acts. But he was a very, you know, A, he was a, a sympathetic and dedicated person, and he wanted, wanted to, appear, to appear on the series. And of course, also at that particular time, he was a big name, and he helped sell the series, whereas somebody like Swanson might not have. So he was a very, very useful name to have at that time. Mm -hmm. Can I just uh, open the floor to any questions Ira might have uh, uh, before we wrap up? I have one that I'd like to ask if, uh about his attack on the Museum of Modern Art. I'm curious who's, some information who's Stern? about St Stern's Seymour? attack. And because Eileen Bowser, the only thing I ever got from her was his attacks against the museum caused it to become easier for people to get films. And uh, Griffith sued the museum. Is it right to talk about that? It's difficult because A, I don't know all the facts. And I've been involved in the, with, the, with the museum for many, many years. And there have been many occasions when I would have loved to attack them myself because of not so much of what they did, but because of their, their, method of, their, their method of working and their sort of rather possessiveness and their keeping away of students from getting access to certain material. Um, so I've had a great many occasions to be really annoyed at the museum and in some of the choices they made and some of their methods of film preservation. But on the other hand, what they've done is so important and so, you know, uh, so useful that it's, it's kind of carping. I mean, everybody, everybody has different priorities. And if I were running a muse the museum myself, I'm sure I would do totally different things, which would annoy different people in different ways. Stern never got involved with working with the museum. He was always he helped Iris Barry do yes. the, the notes on Biograph, but he never helped with any of the productions. He was always in the audience, but never right. participated. Yeah. And then he had uh, Jay Leiter fired from the museum. Right. Yeah. Now the things that Seymour did that were. Uh, certainly arguable. As he was to, no uh, saint. No, I mean, he was a gutsy guy, and I loved him, but he did things that were, I hate to use the word despicable, but they, they, they were certainly very unsympathetic at times, and the Leiter case is very much one of them. Because Jay Leiter is a lovely guy, and a very sympathetic guy, and the kind of guy that you would think that Seymour would love and work with rather than against. Yeah, but he did, one thing he did, is he made enemies with all his friends. Yeah. That somewhere alone alone. Right. Yeah. One thing you should ask is your connection with Griffith. Your son's name is Griffith? Yes, I mean, I, I have no connection. I mean, unfortunately, Griffith died when I was still in the army. In fact, I remember I was in the canteen in the army in Britain when the obituary came on the air, and uh, it was Stroh Strohan delivering this wonderful, eloquent obituary tribute to Griffith. And, of course, the, the fellows in the bar room in the saloon had not, in, the, in the canteen had no interest at all in hearing this, and I literally had to buy them all off and uh, say, you know, take this pound, take that pound, and go and buy a drink and leave me alone with this. So I was able to hear that, that tribute. But I had no direct contact with Griffith at all. I mean, he was dead before I came to this country. But I did have very close contacts for a while with people like May Marsh and Barthelmus and people who'd worked with Griffith. And uh, of course, I'm still very close with Lillian Gish. 
So I've had a lot of sort of very, very close second generation contact with these people. Question, question about the site of the 11 East 14th Street uh, studio, which of course now is covered by this big ugly condo. Was there at any time a plaque marking that? Yes, it was put up, I think, about five years ago by Blanc Sweet. And, but there wasn't a plaque until that point, as far as I know. And then it was immediately stolen by vandals and carted away, so they've, uh, they haven't replaced it. The, the Hackett Carhart building, however, is still, is still intact, mm -hmm. uh, where Bitzer works at the American Mutual Club Club. Right. Have, have you been up there at all? Uh, a long time ago, I think I went up there with, um, it might even have been with Seymour. But it, it goes back at least uh, 25 years now. It's my, my early days in this country when I was trying to see as much as I could of the old studio site here and in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Is there anything left in Fort Lee uh, that would indicate? Well, if anybody uh, went there with somebody who knew, I went there with Edward Finney, who's a producer who died recently and who started out as a child actor in Fort Lee and then became a director later on and worked on some of the Johnny Hines films that were shot there. And we went around Fort Lee and him with a car, and he would point out bits of wall and bits of studio space there, which you could then recognize very easily as being the kind of studio architecture. But I think unless you went around with somebody who knew where to look, you wouldn't find very much, because it's just fragments, it's not complete buildings, it's just, you know, walls and doorways. How about the, the Biograph Studio in the Bronx? Well, that's, that was in very good shape initially. Mm -hmm. I was up there, I um, mean the Gold Medal Studios. Yeah. Yes, I was up there, uh, I guess about 20 years ago before they revamped it. It looked just the same as it must have back in the Griffith days. How about the, the Mamaronek Studios of, of Griffith? Is there any, I know? never went there because Seymour himself assured me that you could see bits of stone, you could recognize, if you knew off into the storm, you could recognize the, the landscape. And I'd been in that area and sort of recognized the area from off into the storm where they built the little... Uh, um, sort of summer house in the peninsula and things like that, but I haven't really made a study of that area at all. And the Vitagraph studio in Brooklyn? Um, those I've been down to. Again, not recently. I went there in the early 50s with Bob Youngson, who has now died, who was a documentary producer. And certainly from the outside, they hadn't, of course they were being used as a TV studio then, so it was, it was still pretty, mu pretty much the same as it must always have been. Very impressive studio. Professor Everson, thank you very much for being on the show. We'd love to have you back again. Uh, Me too, because I we talk so much and we get through so little material. It's an enormous field, so any time. Great, thank you. Thank you. One more question, though. Ah. Cable, television, and video. I'd just like to know, because I'm afraid I look at film as somewhat of a dying art form, mm -hmm. because film and video is the same thing, telling stories with images. What is video and cable future with film? Is film a dying art form? And if you can answer it looking at John. Well, I suppose in a sense it, it is a dying art form because it's a, it has to be a business now. And the, the enthusiasm and the youth and the uh, need to experiment have gone. I mean, it's, you don't make a film now unless either you're a student working on your own personal pet product or unless you're making a million dollar production. That in, that in between area is completely gone. Um, but we're on the verge, obviously, of so many changes. I mean, the, the whole idea of tape um, is such an incredibly valuable tool to be able to put these old films on tape and study them while, even before they're preserved, so that you don't have to say, well, this film can't be touched or copied. It's going to be copied one day, and until then, leave it alone. At least now we can make tapes of these key things and see what we've got, decide if this is an, is an important enough film to preserve on 35 millimeter, or will a 16 negative be sufficient? So that I think tool has become an incredibly, a film at tape has become an incredibly valuable tool for studying film and for, you know, becoming a kind of in interim preservation uh, media. So while I dislike the idea, I mean, I hate the idea of somebody like Griffith spending two years of his life making a great film and pouring his heart and soul into it and coming up with something you can put in your pocket and take away for $39. I mean, to me, that's, you know, it's almost obscene. I like to look at film and smell it and feel there's something substantial there, which I haven't quite gotten to with tape yet. But I do recognize it's, that it obviously is here to stay, no matter what I say, and it's a very, very valuable tool. Excellent. Okay, great. Excellent. Thanks again. Excellent. Is that actually being done?